Turn to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. Being that this is Mother's Day, this morning I want to do a sermon about mothers. It says, Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up, call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. May God bless the reading of his word. The title of my sermon this morning is Mothers as Counter-Revolutionaries. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you for this time we have this morning to look at your word and to look at the important topic of motherhood. Lord, I ask and pray that you use what is preached here this morning for good in the hearts and minds of all those present. May we think well on what goes forth here this day. May each mother hear. Lord, may she be encouraged in heart and mind because of what comes forth from this pulpit this day. May she see the importance of her function and role in the earth as given to her by you, O God. Lord, may she strengthen her hand in all that you've given her to do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You could be seated. During the 1960s, a revolution took place in this country wherein the family came under attack. Prior to this, family was defined along biblical terms. Prior to this revolution, family was defined along biblical terms. A father, a mother, children, till death do us part. The revolution, however, attacked the biblical family, redefined family, employed the popular media to belittle and undermine Christian family, used public policy, government laws, to destroy, through force of law, every vestige of Christian family. No-fault divorce was introduced. The killing of one's sons and daughters by the mothers Fathers having no say whatsoever through abortion was legalized. The floodgates of pornography were opened. And a plethora of laws were passed and enacted which allowed the state to invade the domestic affairs of our lives. A revolution is defined by Webster as an unconstitutional overthrow of an established government. In the case of this revolution of the 1960s, it is God's established government which has been attacked and overthrown by rebellious man here in the nation of America. His law, which was once reflected in the laws of our land, have been undone and replaced with laws which condone and implement life completely contrary to his economy. This is nothing short of a revolution. The elitists that groom and shape this nation and culture hate everything about God, hence they hate the biblical family. Those who reside in this nation and culture hate anything about God that doesn't fit with their concept of God. They attend churches that accommodate their concept of God rather than churches that faithfully teach the Word of God. They attend churches which justify their lifestyles, rather than ones which challenge 
the unbiblical lifestyle, the American lifestyle, which they have embraced. And this brings me to my point in my sermon this morning. Mothers as counter-revolutionaries. A counter-revolution, as defined by Webster, is a revolution intending to undo the results of a revolution. A revolution intending to undo the results of a revolution. If you've ever read the writings of Francis Schaeffer, he always talked about revival, reformation, and revolution. That's because the kingdom of God revolutionizes cultures when people live in obedience to his word. My assertion this morning is that mothers who live in obedience to God are counter-revolutionaries to the God-hating culture which reigns in our day. For example, just consider my wife Clara. Consider her as an example of of being a counter-revolutionary. She's a godly woman. She's a Christian woman who conducts her life in accordance with God's Word. Look at how completely different her life is in comparison with the state of this culture just by comparing her and it in the light of the three great intents of marriage. Who recalls what the three great intents of marriage are as defined by the church for nearly 2,000 years now? laid out by the early church fathers. Three great intents of marriage are, number one, indissolubility. In other words, marriage is till death do us part. Number two is fidelity. In other words, you are faithful to your spouse. You don't try to win the affection of another. And number three is children. Couples actually have children. Those are the three great intents of marriage. Consider Clara as a counter-revolutionary in light of these three great tenths of marriage. Number one, indissolubility. Me and her have been married for 28 years now. That is unusual for this culture. Right now, in America today, one out of every two marriages end in divorce. So for a couple to be married for 28 years, it's remarkable in this culture. And to actually remain married and love each other and can't get enough of each other, is really good. Did you know that right now in America, only 5% of black children will still be living with their biological mother and father when they turn 18 years old? Only 5%. You know how many white children in America today will still be living with their biological mother and father when they turn 18 years old? Only 35%. That's how thoroughly the Christian biblical family has been destroyed by the revolution of the 1960s. And those of us who are older know just how incredible of a revolution it was and how much different America is. So indissolubility is an important matter. And when a woman lives in obedience to God's word, she is a counter-revolutionary to the revolution of the 1960s. By virtue of the fact that she stays married to her husband. The greatest reason for divorce right now amongst couples is women deciding it's time for me. I want to be happy. I've given my life to my children, to my husband. It's time for me. I guarantee you. And they're dropping like flies, marriages all across America. Number two is fidelity. Clara has always only been with me, and never have I ever had the least concern about her faithfulness. Ever. That stands in utter contrast to the thinking of this culture, which feeds on sexual immorality, adultery, pornography, you name it, and everything else. Fidelity is extremely important, and when it's evident within a marriage today, you are a counter-revolutionary. 
you're living in total contrariness to the present culture when you have fidelity towards your spouse. The third great intent of marriage is children. We have 11 of them. The national average right now is 2.1. During the late 1700s, when Ben Franklin did the first demographic work in America, the average woman had eight children. By the end of the 1800s, the average woman had six children. And by the end of the 1900s, the average woman had 2.1 children. And now it's below 2.1. You need 2.1 children just to replace yourselves, according to demographers. We live in a culture that doesn't want to have children, that thinks little of children. Even Christian people think little of their own children. That's why they glibly send them off to government schools, gladly throw them into a daycare center, send them off to the brothel, also known as college, with not a second thought about it. My point, just live according to the Word of God and you are a counter-revolutionary If you want to be radical in this culture, live in obedience to God's Word and you are a radical. I remember I grew up during the 60s and I thought, yeah, I want to be a radical. So all the radicals on TV, oh, let's go against the establishment. Let's be different. It's gone 180 degrees. (laughs) You want to be radical now? You want to be different now? Live godly. And you are a radical. You are a counter-revolutionary in this America. It's so pagan and wicked. Live as a Christian, and your thinking and your behavior are radically different from the bulk of this culture. Being radical means that you hold views which are rudimentally different than the status quo. That is the case for a Christian in America today. We are radicals, and when we live in accordance with God's Word, we are counter-revolutionaries to the ruling establishment. We stand in defiance of all they stand for. We repudiate what they try to press upon the masses in our country because our allegiance is to Christ and to His Word. Amen? I do not mean this in the sense of historic radicalism when I talk about being radical, but I mean it as simply being radical to the present culture we live in. Biblical radicalism, if you will. Which is simply faithfulness to Christ. When it comes to motherhood, we live in a nation which belittles motherhood and heralds as important to the woman her almighty career. Women are taught by this culture that their worth is found primarily outside the home. Scripture teaches something radically different, that the woman finds her worth inside the home. Just look at our text here in Proverbs chapter 31. The Bible makes clear here that the woman's career is found in her husband, in her home, and in her family, her children. Her career is found in her husband, in her home, and in her family, her children. Look at verses 11 and 12 here in Proverbs 31. It says, the heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. He knows she isn't going to go out with the credit card and blow a bunch of money and put the family in debt. A godly woman is a frugal woman. By the way, as you read through here, you see that women are to gather the things, and that's good. Men hate shopping. Women love shopping. Do they not? They do. (laughs) so let them go at it men (laughs) but it says the heart of her husband safely trusts her so he'll have no lack of gain she does him good and not evil all the days of her life her career is found in being a helpmate to her husband this culture immortalizes 
heralds and holds up as models women who do everything outside their home. Do they not? I just heard it on the news this morning on the way on the radio. I can't remember what they were talking about. Talking about some woman. The only type of women they ever put up before this culture is women who spent their whole lives at some career, some business, some government position, you name it. And they hold that up as a model to women. It's totally contrary to God's economy. When's the last time you heard any news report of a woman who died or was being awarded with something, who faithfully remained married to her husband, bore a bunch of kids, has a bunch of grandkids, a bunch of great-grandkids, and is done biblically right before God in her role and function as a woman. Have you even heard that on Christian news? No. This whole culture wants the woman to think her career, her worth is found outside the home. God's word is repetitively clear. Her worth is found inside the home. The word home or household is mentioned three times here in Proverbs 31. Verse 15 says she rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household. Verse 21 says she is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. Verse 27 says she watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Does this seem oppressive to you? What women are, what this talks about that women do? I spend time on the university campuses. I run into lots of young people who tell me that the Christian form of family is so oppressive. It's oppressive. And women have been oppressed down through history. Feminists make out like women have been oppressed all throughout history, and only in the last hundred years have they been liberated from oppressive patriarchal males. When you read Proverbs 31, does it seem oppressive to you? Here's this ancient piece of literature, the book of Proverbs, and here's women going out shopping, buying land, and impacting the community. What's so oppressive about that? This isn't oppressive. Here's a fresh thought for the feminists and for the feminized males in our culture. They decided to work together as man and wife, each in their own God-given role and function. Down through history, our women are treated as ebbed and flowed, but I submit to you that the current liberation for women has put them in one of the worst predicaments they have been in down through history so-called liberation of the status actually is more oppressive on women than ever. And I've talked about that in the past. Perhaps I'll do a whole sermon on that in the future. The woman's career is also found in her children, in her family. Proverbs 31, verse 28 says, Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. You, as a mother, have the power to shape lives, for good or for evil. Remember the saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world? <laughs> it's because women have a huge impact on their sons and daughters. The state does all it can to keep children away from their parents, including their mothers, Wants people to put their kids off in daycare, then send them off to the government school, then send them off to the government college, on down the line. The state does all it can to remove children from their parents as much as possible, to undermine the authority and influence of the parents. And the popular culture adds to that. Just watch what's on TV. Every young person hates their parents. And every parent is a befuddled fool. There's always some teacher who's there to rescue children from their parents. Do you know how stupid that is? Do you know how contrary to nature that is? Do you know how much contrary that is to statistical fact? 
even a poll done last year, showed that children, the number one influence in their lives, even with all that the statists have done to undermine the family and destroy families in this country, 84% of young people point to their parents as having the most influence on their lives, for good or for evil. They point to their parents. Hillary said it takes a village to raise a child. Baloney. Hillary needs to get slapped down. <laughs> it's true. I met some of these little haughty feminists on campus and some of these little feminized males on campus. You know, Mark Belling was actually talking about this this week. How he noticed that men in their 20s act like women now and women in their 20s act like men. How there's been a total role change in this culture, generally speaking. Not everybody, generally speaking. So they were talking about that. I was dying to call in. I got a whole list of why it's that way. Do you think you can groom a culture a certain way through popular media and through public policy, government law, and it doesn't have consequences? It doesn't have results? They wanted an egalitarian society, and now they have one. Do you think you can raise males for 20 years shoving down their throat that it's okay to be a homosexual and it not have practical implications on how men behave? Let me tell you, you can't even challenge a young man's manhood anymore and get a fight out of him. That's how effeminized the males are in this country, on these universities. It's despicable. Mark Belling brought up the point of this homosexual who got some young, acting like he was a woman, got some young guys at high school to send in salacious photos of themselves to him. And then he threatened them he would publicize their racy photos if they didn't have relations with him as a homosexual. And you know what they did? They had relations with him as a homosexual. This was a case over in New Berlin, you may recall. Mark Belling pointed out, because I had just gotten cl done cl telling Claire this, you know, when I was young, we would have got our friends together and beat the living hell out of them. <laughs> That's what would have happened to them. And Mark Belling said the exact same thing. Yeah, I know. It's so terrible to think that way. You know, we got a phony Christianity in this country that is a feminized males too. What most people look for in a minister is how gentle he is, how softly he talks. I hear that from people all the time. I love my pastor. He is such a gentle man. I hear that from women all the time. He's such a gentle man. You wonder why men have abandoned Christianity in America? It's because of the type of Christianity we have in America. You have to kowtow to the effeminization that is so prevalent in the church, which is just emulating the culture, in order to excel in American Christianity. And it's sickening. Look how a godly society responds to a woman who finds her career in her husband, in her home, and in her family, and her children. Verse 31 says, Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Let her own works praise her in the gates. You know what the gates represent, right? The public. The public. The public in a godly society praises mothers. Upholds and extols the virtues of motherhood doesn't denigrate them, doesn't undermine them, doesn't belittle them with Hillary comments about baking cookies. The Bible makes clear here that the woman's career is found in her husband, her home, and in her family. Do you want to know why many godly families don't even go to churches anymore? Because the churches have decided to accommodate themselves to the culture at large. 
And when someone decides to live their life in accordance with the biblical model of family, they don't even fit in at the churches anymore. Because all the Christians have conformed to the world and how they govern their families. The Bible praises motherhood. The Bible honors motherhood. This culture denigrates motherhood. Motherhood teaches women to put others before themselves. This culture teaches women to think only of themselves. Children are viewed as a hindrance of one's fulfillment. Hence, you can kill them in the womb, take control of your reproductive abilities. Just so you can further your career and not allow men to enslave you to those little beasts. Having children is all about men holding you down, keeping you lower on the corporate ladder. That's what this culture teaches. Even our laws in America encourage women to go outside the home and work. For example, look at the taxation rate. People want to get all the things the Joneses have next door. They have no leadership abilities within themselves. They're followers. Most people are. i got to have what my neighbor's got. Well, honey, you're going to have to go work. There's something sickening about a man who wants to kick his wife out of the home and make her go work when he's got children at home. Something sickening about that. Do you know that in 1955, 17.6% of what you made went to taxation? By 1995, the same family, 39.5% of your income goes to taxation. So if you made, what, $50,000, $10,000 more of the money you make is going to the government than it was 40 years ago. Our public policy itself forces women out of the home to go work. If you look at the IRS Form 1040, next time you're filling that out, You will notice that if you pay someone else to raise your two children, that's what people have, two children, the IRS will let you take $6,000 off your tax bill. In other words, one earner families subsidize two earner families, even though two earner families typically make 60% more money than the one earner families. That's public policy encouraging the woman to leave the home. And go out and work. It's evil. It's disgusting. And that's why if you follow the biblical model of family, you are a counter-revolutionary to the revolution that took place in the 60s here in America. When one takes time to observe and investigate, he realizes the whole of our popular culture and public policy in this nation stands opposed to motherhood and biblical family. And we've been quiet about it far too long. Let me close by saying, motherhood is part of God's created order. That's right. Motherhood is part of God's created order. As much as the state and the status and the secularists and the feminists and the effeminized males would love for children to be created in Petri dishes, spend nine months in a test tube, and break the glass and they're there in your arms. No, motherhood is part of God's created order. It takes a woman. Women have children. Wow. Shocking, fresh thought to Americans. Women have children. Children happen. Okay? Okay. It's part of the logical, created order of God. You fall in love, you marry, you have children. You have to act contrary to the created order not to have children. The vast majority do. 
I understand some are, can't have children. Women are to stay back at the nest and care for the children. This is also seen in God's created order. How? How do you see in God's created order that women are to care for the children back at the nest? They have the breasts. That's how the created order shows it. A man is not to stay home with an apron on with the children while his wife is out working. Not to mention, it's also seen not only in God's created order, but it's also seen in God's revealed word. Both in Titus 2.5, women are instructed to be homemakers. And in 1 Timothy 5.14, they're instructed to manage the house. It is natural for women to want to have children. It is aberrant for them to not want to have children. It is diabolical for them to murder their own children. A recent Gallup poll found that only 4% of adults say they will be satisfied if they never have children. Only 4% of adults, even today, in this anti-child world, 4%, only 4% say they'll be satisfied if they never have children. My point, having children is part of God's created order. It's right within us. The rate of regret for the childless is huge, according to the Gallup poll. 76% of the childless, 41 years and older, say they regret that they had no children and wish they had. I can assure you that once you get to 60 years and older, the percentile rate is surely in the 90s of regret that they never had children. Having children is part of God's created order. This is how we leave part of ourselves here on earth. Our time here is transient. It is short. We can shape the lives of others, our children, that they might live to the glory of God. And all the world knows this task is laid primarily in the hands of mothers. You would think, therefore, that this culture and nation would honor and extol the virtues of motherhood. Rather, it undermines and denigrates it. I was pointing out to Clara this past week how all of the health officials, the government officials in the state of Wisconsin held a convention here in Milwaukee over this epidemic of babies dying in their parents' beds. And how this is horrible. And how we need to convince people not to allow them uh, themselves to allow their children to be in bed with them. How they need to have their own crib or their own bassinet. You know, anything to get the children away from the parents. We raised 11 children. All of them slept in our bed till they were about a year and a half old. All of them lived to tell the story. What's going on there is either the woman's so soused and drunk she rolls over on the baby, or she just killed the kid herself, smothered the kid herself, and then uses that as an excuse. When you see the government officials gather together like that to have a conference, it's just a matter of time. They already have the billboards up in the city now. Encouraging people not to sleep with their babies in their own bed. Just a matter of time before it will become a criminal act. Something happens to your baby while they're sleeping in your bed. No one will be there to comfort you from the state. They'll be there to put the handcuffs on you and prosecute you. That's how the game's played. Busybodies. That's what government officials are for the most part. Busybodies with too much time on their hands to stick their nose in everybody else's life. And I just cannot believe how Americans put up with it. If the Americans of the 1800s ever saw how we live today and what we've let our government become, they would be rioting in the streets tomorrow morning. And there would be government officials tarred and feathered or hanging from lampposts with ropes around their neck by tomorrow morning. That's what would happen. 
Our church catechism says in question 162, what is the origin of the family? And the answer is, the origin of the family is God, who created mankind in his image. Adam and Eve were the first family. The next question, 163, says, how does man exercise dominion? The answer is, man exercises dominion by having children and by bringing every area of life into conformity with God's law. Question 164 says, what is marriage? The answer is, marriage is the joining together by God of a man and a woman of like Christian faith in order to raise a family and exercise dominion. Question 165 is, how is family dominion exercised? The answer is, the man with his helper wife exercised dominion in the family as custodians of children and property. Question 170 is, what is the family's chief end? The answer is, the family's chief end is to glorify God, obey God's laws, advance his kingdom, and enjoy his blessings now and forever. Ladies, though this nation and the elitists who run it may be little motherhood, be encouraged. Yours is a God-given profession. The impact of which is inestimable. Let's stand up and close in prayer. Hallelujah, Father. Lord, we thank you for this time to consider motherhood. We see in your scriptures repeatedly, from beginning to end, Lord, motherhood being honored and its virtues extolled. Lord, we see that it's part of your created order. Lord, you see that we live in a nation now where state government is invading family government meddling in our domestic affairs where it has no right to do so. Lord, I ask and pray that Christian men in this country would become tired of this and would take action, speak about these things, write about them, and see these laws changed. Lord, we thank you that you've redeemed us. We thank you that you preserved your word for us so we can know your ways and thoughts. We don't have to just feel about in the darkness of life. But we can know what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad. Father, I ask and pray that we would make your law known to this nation in regards to family. Lord, I ask that you help each one of us as men to be good husbands and fathers. And Lord, on this special day for Mothers, we ask and pray for each woman that you help them to be a good wife and a good mom. Lord, I ask and pray that each child here would honor their mother. Father, that they would not bring discord into the home, but that homes here would be able to live in harmony as we all live in submission to you and your law word. And Lord, we ask for these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hallelujah. Could be seated. We're going to take communion at this time, and you can feel free to take communion with us um, as long as you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, we ask that you not take communion. The Lord's table is something for believers to observe and not unbelievers. You don't have to be a member of this church to observe the Lord's table here at Mercy Seat. Um, You just have to be a believer. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Amen? This is the great salvation God has provided us with through His Son. At His table, there are only two elements. The bread, which represents His body, and the fruit of the vine, which represents His blood, and absolutely nothing else. Amen? Signifying that it's through Christ alone that we're able to meet with the Father. Now, man always wants to think it's something that he's done that gives him right standing with God. Often, before we become Christians, we think, well, if our good works outweigh our bad works, well, then God will meet with us. (laughs) God will accept us into heaven. We had more good works than bad works. Then when we become a Christian, we realize how dopey that thinking is, but yet we can still creep up in our life. We can begin to think it's through faith in Jesus plus our good works. That's what gives us right standing with God. And this time at his table reminds us, no, it's through Christ alone, because at his table there isn't these two elements plus a list of how many hours you spent in prayer or a list of how many people you witnessed to this last week. There's just these two elements which represent Christ alone. Amen? Signifying the fact that whether you've been a Christian for five seconds or 55 years, it's always only through Jesus that we get to have right standing with the Father. Amen? Now, spending hours in prayer and witnessing to people, those things are the result. They're the fruit. They're the evidence of our saving faith in Christ. In other words, we don't do those good works to try and obtain God's acceptance. We do those good works because we have obtained God's acceptance. And there's a huge difference between the two. A whole reformation took place about 500 years ago over that very issue. And it's important for us to understand that. Amen? God has provided us with a great salvation. It's found through Christ. It is through Him alone that we can meet with the Father. When we do so, He supplies us with His Spirit. And the Spirit is the one who enables us to live as Christian men and women. We cannot do it in the energy of our own flesh. As Christ himself said, I am the vine, you are the branches. You can do nothing without me. Amen? We are utterly dependent upon him to live right before God. God never intended man to live for him without him. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Lord, we thank you for the great salvation you have provided us with through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you redeemed us, that when we were in rebellion to you, shaking our fist in your hand, spitting on your law, yet you loved us. Praise your holy name. We thank you, O God, that your Holy Spirit convicted us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, showing us our need for your Son, showing we were sinners in need of a Savior. We thank you that you redeemed us unto yourself, Not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with his precious blood, which was shed at Calvary. We thank you for the redemption you have provided us with. I ask that we go forth from this place, O God, as your faithful ambassadors, and we make your holy law and this great salvation known to others. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Praise his name. Let's stand up and we'll worship him and then I'll close in prayer. Hallelujah, Lord. We give thanks and praise to you. Blessed is your holy name. Glory and honor unto you. And you could swear by no greater, Father, you swore by yourself, saying, Forever shall he be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Blessed is your name, Lord Jesus. Glory and honor unto you. We thank you for the redemption. Thank you, O God. Blessed is your name. Father, I ask and pray that you be with us now as we leave this place. 
Help us to think well on what went forth from the pulpit this day. Build these things in each one's life. Help them not to just go along with the status quo, but to examine things in light of your word and not conform themselves, but rather have their minds transformed by the renewing of your word, that they might live in conformity to your word. Counter-revolutionaries in a wicked culture, bringing hope and light to a nation which is an utter rebellion to you. Lord, I just ask and pray that you help each man here to be a priest to his home this coming week and to open your word to his wife and to his children and instruct them from it. Pray for each mom, each woman here, O God, that she be a helpmate to her husband, that she be a nurturer of her children, an anchor in the home, O Lord. Lord, I ask and pray that each child would be a blessing to the home, desirous to live in accordance with your word, honoring their mother and their father. Help each young person to use their strength in service to you, O God, and not to squander it on selfish pursuits. Blessed is your holy name. Lord, we pray that each grandparent and great-grandparent here will be an example of godly living to their progeny. May our days here in the earth count for you and to the glory of your kingdom. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And happy Mother's Day.